God of all grace, after you have suffered a little, may himself perfect you, confirm you, establish you. To him be glory and empire forever and ever. Amen. Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. So briefly then, concerning the overturning of Roe v. Wade, you knew I was going to say something about that, right? <laughs> You'd be very surprised and probably disappointed if I didn't. Uh, on one hand, in no way does this change the fact that any political system that allows such matters of life and death to be voted upon, or, yeah, anything of this nature, by either the people or the, those who are, are governing, um, is doomed to fail an abomination in sight of God. The moral law is a fixed reality and therefore never to be subjugated to the democratic process. Be that as it may, as we live in a reality, right, that is beyond our control, and seeing that every soul is created with an immortal destiny and the right to life is indeed therefore inviolable, okay, this ruling is incredibly monumental and easily the biggest Supreme Court decision of my lifetime. Okay, so, um, it just so happens it's something I, I was thinking about. I not really thought it, I never really thought about it very much in terms of for myself, but Roe v. Wade was passed uh, it was January 22nd of 1973. I was most likely conceived sometime in March of 73. Uh, and so I was scheduled quote unquote to be born in December of 73. So if I didn't have the parents I had, I literally could have been conceivably one of the first uh, victims of this law. So the fact that, I mean, it, it just, just the very fact in a sense it makes it a little way, a little bit more personal for you because I can look back and say, wow, that was what was happening you know, just before I was conceived. <laughs> okay, so uh, it was uh, something that I look at now and it's pretty incredible to think about. And I never really thought that in my lifetime, I, until the reign of Mary, I never thought that a law like this would be passed, that it would be reversed like this. But basically, the big point about it is, even though there's so many things it doesn't correct, and it, it, it doesn't help, the fact is that this is a, it's public in nature, clearly demonstrates that abortion is not a federal right, okay, at all. While the other so-called, we talked about earlier this week, uh, Catholic countries, have been doing the exact opposite, whether it be Ireland or Mexico, you know, all those are supposed to be defending the right to life are doing the opposite of what this law now, or the overturning of this law does. Uh, so what the trickle-down effect will be, we will see. It probably will have some really big ramifications. You know, even though, again, there's still other issues like you know, other sins crying out for vengeance, right? There are other big problems, uh, you know, be it, <coughs> You know, the LBGQ, LP, basically, people, <laughs> or they still are doing what they're doing, right? Not stopping. But still, again, it does say something especially to have been done, have happened on the Feast of the Most Sacred Heart. What was a quote somebody sent to me, I will reign in the midst of my enemies, right? So that's, it's true. It is God saying, I'm still here, right? So. So it, we don't want to be too negative, or as soon as everything, anytime something happens, oh, well, it doesn't mean anything because, you know, Christ is still not reigning as king in a nation, which we know. But we'll take what we can get while we can get it. And it is, in fact, in large part, maybe our prayers, the sacrifices, and long-suffering, and maybe God has had some mercy on this country for that. You know, who believes that is Francis, right? He was saying it's because of you know, in America, this resistance, you know, this, this, these remnants of tradition, these remnants of antiquatedness, or however you want to put it, that is the reason why, you know, there's still this kind of, but like this, this kind of law could be overturned because of that. He sees it as a bad thing, right? But we know, obviously, that it's good. And it's a sign that God's grace is still at work in this land in spite of the monstrous iniquities being committed. So, maybe before the divine tribunal, a certain stay of execution during this whole thing that's going on, maybe, maybe we obtain a little bit more, but again, not to labor, but it's, it's something that we don't know what the effects will be for ourselves in the little picture, in the big picture, but it's still something that uh, how much, however much it ultimately does is, is good that it happened, and I never thought in my lifetime I would see it. Okay, so. 
given what we read this morning, it is clear with that with all the sacramental graces we have received, especially in baptism, Holy Communion, Confirmation, the old Adam is meant to be virtually dead in us, and the new Adam, Jesus Christ, reigning in our mind, our heart, and will almost completely. I say almost because he does allow for venial sins. He does allow us to commit at least small sins against him, even those who are progressing very much in the way of perfection, because in, in order to keep us humble, in order to make sure that we don't, in our progress, forget him. Okay. I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Okay. So, now, he wants to live in us, suffer in us, die again in us, that we might live with him now and forever. By our baptism, we are incorporated into his death, as the scripture teaches. Part of making this reality is not just avoiding mortal sin and willful venial sin, but little by little overcoming the effects of original sin, maybe especially the darkness of intellect, which militates against the life of grace in the soul. It could be that this wound of ignorance is the worst of all of the wounds of original sin. Of course, we have the concupiscence of the flesh, the concupiscence of the eyes, the pride of life, right? But this, this darkness of the intellect, remember, it's the intellect that informs the will. So if the intellect is not, not informing the will, the will is going to do whatever it wants. It's going to just go this way or that way. It has no anchor, right? So the wound of ignorance is the one that can be the most difficult for us to deal with because it is pervasive and it is one that aggravates in a way all of the others. Okay, so we ha and it's one that we have to deal with every day. We think we make progress one day in the knowledge of God, and the next day is we're starting all over again. Are we getting up to this morning? Are we staying in bed? Are we hitting the snooze bar? Right? You know, what is the choice we make? Because that first choice actually increases or decreases our ignorance of soul. Right? So each day we're either increasing in knowledge or decreasing, or we're becoming more ignorant of the ways of God. It's, it's like the St. Augustine says, we're either moving forward or backwards, <coughs> always. So, now, now, most deny, either explicitly or implicitly, that there even is such a thing as a supernatural life and destiny of the soul. A super Pelagianism, if you will. I use that term because the Pelagianism was an old heresy that said that we don't need God to do good. We don't need God to get to heaven. Okay? It's good that God's there, but I can do good works and get there on my own. Right? That's what Pelagianism is. So this is a part of the big words here, right? So in corruption of will. But there was a semi-Pelagianism that said we work with God to get to heaven, which sounds Catholic. And it can there's a way to understand it in a Catholic sense. But the way they say it is basically God is doing what he's doing in us, and we're doing what we're doing, not God in us at work, right? So that's a heresy as well. Well, super Pelagianism goes even beyond any of this. It goes the opposite direction and basically says, not only do we not need God, you know, we don't work with God at all, you know, not only do we not need him, he's not, he's not even existing, and we can be like God, basically. You know, so we take the place of God. Pelagianism comes close to that, but it's, quite, it's not quite that audacious. But now that is basically, at least implicitly, what many people believe. We become like gods. We, we become our own master, right? So that's where we have to step in the breach, and we have to not be Pelagianism, semi-Pelagianisms, or super Pelagianisms, right? It's, it's, I should say, we have to be Catholic, and part of that is simply when we look at the verse today: the renunciation of self. After we have suffered a little. He will he himself will perfect you, confirm you, and establish you. Right? To him be glory and empire forever and ever. Okay? So we need to remember and remind ourselves that the suffering that we undergo now, maybe for our past sins in particular, uh, or maybe just from, from this wound of ignorance, is that if we persevere and we stay with Christ and we, we study, we pray, we, we keep doing the things that we know we need to be doing, that in a little while we will obtain greater knowledge of him, 
unlike the tree of good and evil, which the Adam and Eve ate of that tree and their eyes were open, but in the worst way possible, little by little, by self-denial and by obedience to God, His commandments, and specifically for our state of life, what we're supposed to be doing, little by little, knowledge is granted to us. True knowledge of God is granted to us. So that we can follow Him. We, we know with moral certainty of our salvation and we follow him in his ways in a way that we're more confident that we're actually doing his will and not our own. Okay, so uh, something we always want to keep in mind, that the, the importance of persevering this day because we don't know if we have tomorrow. And what seems like such a long time now will not seem that way at all we are, when we are on the other side of the veil, so to speak. Okay. Wishing we had even one more minute, but that minute will never be granted. So we have to today militate in every way that we can against this, this wound of ignorance that tends to make us kind of want to just live in that ignorance of God and of the supernatural life and destiny of our soul. And realize, no, we, this is a great privilege that we have. Okay. Now, to overcome these effects outside of, of, the, of the sins that we committed and this, this ignorance we're talking about, outside of the fact that we, when we were remaining with Christ and His will, and we suffer that weaning from the world, that St. Augustine you know, to the glory talks about, this weaning away from creature comforts. And whatnot, that, that we, there's a suffering that we undergo for that. That would be the pure purgation of the senses of St. John of the Cross. But if we persevere in that, that's a, that, the greatest penance that we can have to make up for those past sins. So that if we suffer that patiently, then we know that ultimately we'll come through it and our, our nature will be healed in such a way that we truly want that which is good and, and we're not our rules are not bent, rules are not bent to turn that which is evil or that which is worldly. Uh, so some of it is simply dealing with <coughs> this, the pain of loss now, so we don't have to deal with the pain of loss later in purgatory or worse than that. Okay, so the other thing is the imitation of the sacred heart. That is what can increase our knowledge of God just as much as anything else that we can do looking at the dispositions of the Sacred Heart in the Gospels towards sinners. Today they came, to, they beckoned unto him, they listened to him, they, 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 these, these poor people who otherwise, they're called sinners for a reason, but they came unto him to listen to him, he loved them. So no matter how sinful we are, if we're beckoning unto him, if we're looking for him, you know, like that one sheep, right? Christ will find you, right? Or the groat. Christ will find you. So, uh, in all of this, we look at Christ's disposition to the sinners. We see in the Gospels how often, how much he loves them. He doesn't reject them. He does not send them away. The lepers, he's not afraid of. Of course, he could not be sick because of them, because he's God, right? So there's no fear there in that sense. But he knew that people would, would look at him very differently. Why is he around lepers, right? They don't, didn't know he was God. Just think, I don't want to be near him, because then he's probably going to give us you know, something worse than COVID, right? <laughs> but whatever. It's just, but this is the attitude now. People get afraid, right? So afraid. But we see the disposition of the Sacred Heart overcomes every obstacle, right? So if we see that, we apply that to ourselves, how he looks at us, and then how in turn we are to look at our brethren, those that are easy to love and those that are not easy to love. That's how we overcome the wound of ignorance. Because that's how we become like Christ. And no longer fearing, uh, there's no longer fearing the loss of our time or you know, invading in a way our personal space or whatnot. Or whatever, it, it, fill in the blank whatever way you want. Okay, <coughs> but the point is that the imitation of the sacred heart is a sure, fast way by meditating on the scripture, by meditating maybe upon the the Imitation of Christ, or The Imitation of the Sacred Heart, which is written by a French priest, put out by ten books and publishers, 
from about 100, 150 years ago, broken up into four books, just like the Imitation of Christ. So you see, what, you know, in terms of Christ speaking to the soul, back and forth, what his dispositions are towards you, right? And then towards those you encounter each day. Some of them you encounter very much, but by applying this in your daily life, you, you'll find all of a sudden that one time, you may just meet up with somebody that you may never see again. And that what they take from you is the one and only time, the only chance you have with them. Whether or not you have a chance to preach or not, if you're looking at them through the eyes of the Sacred Heart, right, then uh, you will help them to get to heaven. And you'll be helping yourself at the same time. And that's how we, we militate against the effects of original sin. Okay, so more than anything else, and of course, the sacraments, which give us Christ himself, but then how do we benefit from that except through the imitation of the sacred heart, which is the model of every virtue. Okay, now, the, we just celebrated the Feast of the Nativity of St. John the Baptist, and we'll see a connection here in a moment. We're just saying he was not a priest, but he did what every good priest must do, direct the faithful to the sacred heart. If you've ever seen an image of the Lamb of God, then the Behold the Lamb of God of St. John the Baptist okay, is substantially the same as if he said, Behold the Sacred Heart. The Lamb that is wounded in the heart with the precious blood flowing out from it. That's the Sacred Heart. Okay, so the same, it's as if he said that one and the same thing. So just as he pointed to the Lamb of God, he was pointing to the Sacred Heart. Okay. Now, the precious blood flowing forth from that lamb is actually the feast of this Friday, as we said. Okay. It is always the octave day of the nativity of St. John the Baptist in the old calendar, which we follow. The church, therefore, bears witness liturgically to the intimate connection between the sacred heart, the precious blood that flows from it, and the mission of the one born to point to the way for others to be fed of him in his doctrine and literally, substantially, physically in his body, blood, soul, and okay. Every priest of the new law is greater than St. John, at least on earth. <laughs> he pointed to the Sacred Heart. We make him present on the altar of every Mass. Okay. Infinite difference. Now, if even a handful of us could be half as holy as St. John was, or as St. John Marie Baptiste Vianney, whose name comes from St. John the Baptist, who is the, the patron saint of parish priests, Maybe we could do better than simply getting Roe v. Wade overturned. Okay, so we pray for that. Pray for priests that we not just be functionaries, but that we actually be holy, that we can communicate Christ to you, point the way to the Sacred Heart, and feed you with the precious blood in a way that is worthy of him, in a way that St. John the Baptist would have done had he been a priest. Okay, so, so then today, in order that we may work towards being free of sin, becoming servants to God, First, look upon the punishments received for our sins as just. <coughs> Submit to them more sincerely than in the past. And do not flee from that punishment. Do not flee from that pain of loss that we experience. Accept whatever else might come as a result. Then make an examination of conscience, not only for our sins, for getting to the root of the consequences of original sin, especially the darkened intellect that keeps necessary and specific considerations out of the head, which then keeps it out of the will. Then review and resolve before the Blessed Sacrament to make the dispositions of the Sacred Heart your own, both alone and in your encounters with others daily, with a little help from some daily spiritual reading. Then the old Adam will take his place in the lower part of our will, and the new Adam, our Lord Jesus Christ, will begin to reproduce and relive his life in us. Then we begin to be perfected, confirmed, and established in him as promised by St. Peter today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.